I want to give a little more basis for this prediction. The source of it that I'm going to talk about, this essay that Neil deGrasse Tyson wrote, I saw this talk back about 15 years ago. So before Neil deGrasse Tyson had his big TV shows and was on The Daily Show and everything, he gave a talk at an ACM meeting in this was maybe 1999, so I think exactly 15 years ago, that this essay is based on. And the essay is about progress in science. His basis for the essay is this experiment done 15 years earlier when he was at Princeton and he went to the library. His goal was to figure out how knowledge in astrophysics is changing over time. The proxy for measuring this was just to look at the thickness of the books. Certainly not necessarily a completely accurate way to measure knowledge, but not a horrible way. And it's something that's easy to measure. So he looked at, well, we've got the subscription to the Astrophysical Journal, which apparently is where most astrophysical knowledge is published. And he wanted to figure out where is the midpoint. So you've got all these volumes in the library. Where's the halfway point? And the journal had been publishing since 1895. So that was the beginning. So where do you think the midpoint would be if he did this in 1990? Has anyone been in a library? They do have like musty places with journals like this. So you could do the experiment. I, I don't necessarily recommend going to the library to do it because it's dangerous down there. So where do you think the midpoint is going to be? So when I asked the midpoint, so the experiment he did was look at the physical midpoint halfway between here and what year is that. So that's what I'm asking is what year do we think is in the middle of the books? OK, good. Yeah, so it, it was 15 years ago. He basically did the experiment looking each time he looked at the midpoint. This was 15 years before today. This was today. Another 15 years was the next midpoint, and another 15, and another 15. So every 15 years, it seemed like the thickness of those journals was doubling. That is consistent with lots of other things. So if you look, and this is also from his article, if, if you are trying to learn about the universe, you want to do a simulation. And to learn something really new from a simulation, his estimate is you have to scale it by about a factor of 10. You're not going to learn anything new if your simulation is just a little bigger than the last one. But if you can scale it by a factor of 10, then it's becoming really interesting. And if you can do that for a 3D simulation, which is what we're typically simulating the universe for, you need to scale by a factor of 10 in each dimension, so you're scaling by a factor of 1,000. What he's saying is that scaling simulating the universe is a cubic cost. In order to learn something new, we need to scale by a factor of 10. So how long does it take to double the amount of information we know about the universe? So we're going to assume computing power is doubling every 18 months, what you can get for the same cost. And in order to learn more about the universe, we need to scale our simulation by a factor of 10 in each dimension. How much does computing power increase every month if it's doubling every 18 months? So we could do some math, or we could plug it into Wolfram Alpha if you're not good at math. And it'll tell us x is 1.039, so about 4% a month. Seems like a pretty reasonable increase. If we increase 4% a month up to 1,000, so we're looking for a solution for x, where we're increasing 4% a month up to 1,000, what we get is 180 months. If we divide that by 12, we get almost exactly 15 years. Wow. So this 15-year doubling is totally consistent with, and he didn't actually do this math in his paper. It's sort of very convenient that it works out. But this doubling knowledge of the universe is very consistent with what we expect computer power to increase every 15 years. So if we keep at this rate, and you should all live, well, so partly figuring out how long you're going to live depends on other things, whether life expectancy will increase much above what it is now. But you should expect at least four more doublings of what we know about the universe. So will there be any mystery left after that? Einstein isn't sure. It may be infinite what there is to know. It may not be. We will know a lot more if we expect what we know to double every 15 years. And it probably will. And the argument that Tyson makes in that paper is this is something that applies really to any field where what you're learning is building on what you already know. So there are fields that don't have endless golden ages where it doesn't seem like you're building on previous knowledge. Most of the humanities is kind of like that. They look to the golden age of literature and say, well, that was the 1700s or the 1600s or whenever it was. It's not an endless golden age. They don't think that literature is continually getting better. 
But anything that you're building on previous work has this property. And we look at Moore's law as something, well, maybe that's running out. And that's only you know, applied for the last 40 or 50 years. But all of these trends are much longer than that. They go back to the printing press. They go back to learning language. All of these things contribute to increasing knowledge. And if we can increase 4% per year, that means it's doubling every 15 years. If we can increase 4% per month, like computing power, that means we're going up by a factor of 1,000 every 15 years. These are very hard for humans to contemplate, things like doubling and going up by a factor of 1,000. But this is what we should expect. In terms of computing power, Moore's Law gives us this cost of buying the power. What really matters is the cost of using it, and that's energy. That trend seems to be very stable over an even longer period of time. On a log scale, the straight line, so we're, the amount of computation you can do for the same amount of energy, which is what really matters, because that's what you're, what you're really paying to do the computation, is also increasing exponentially. When you look at things like that, you end up with some fairly both exciting as well as scary possibilities about the future. And Ray Kurzweil is one of the more outspoken people about this, talking about this exponential growth just within a few decades, leading to the singularity where machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence. I think that this is a little bit of a stretch in the sense that there are many things where machine intelligence has surpassed human intelligence for at least the last 40 years. I don't think there's one generic moment where all of a sudden machine intelligence surpasses human intelligence in, in everything, which is kind of what, what he's suggesting. So there are going to be things that humans are better at computers at, and there are going to be fewer and fewer of them going forward. We're going to have to figure out, hopefully, there'll be good things left for humans to do. But this is all, this really should be all optimistic progress for the most part. Now, if you look at the School of Engineering's strategic plan, the number one goal is to not have any progress. This seems really depressing to me in the sense of if you look at the last 200 years, how much progress there's been. We should be certainly worried about not destroying things. But if we're satisfied for just sustaining what we have, that is really bleak. So we should be trying to improve. We should be striving for progress. We should be finding ways to share the things that we have with the rest of the world that is not yet as rich. And we should be inventing new things, not just trying to sustain what we have. So this is a really optimistic view. You should be a little skeptical. And that sustainability number one bullet point suggests some skepticism that maybe we shouldn't be completely optimistic that everything's always getting better, because some of the things that are changing exponentially maybe are in changing ways that are going to lead to catastrophes, lead to things getting worse. The biggest proponent of that worldview, at least the biggest early one, was Reverend Malthus, who back in 1798 wrote an essay about population growth. What Malthus said was this. Started with this very optimistic, right? There have been all these discoveries, and natural philosophy back then meant science. There have been all these discoveries in the 1700s, Things like the printing press meant knowledge was being diffused more rapidly. There's a spirit of inquiry throughout the world. All these things were leading to some big change in the fate of mankind. The change he was worried about was this one. So he has these two postulates. The first is that we need food. And the second is that people will keep making babies. He concludes that population is going to grow geometrically. And subsistence is only growing arithmetically. If you look at the limit there, where the amount of food per person is increasing linearly and the number of people is increasing geometrically, eventually we're going to have zero food per person. This looks quite scary. It seems like we should have all starved. We don't seem to have all starved yet. So this either means that there was something wrong with Malthus's logic, or we just haven't waited long enough. If that limit only tells us eventually that will happen. It doesn't tell us when it's going to happen. Are we eventually going to all starve, or was there something wrong with Malthus's logic? OK, good, yeah. So his assumption that agricultural production isn't exponential, right? He assumed that it was linear. And that's a big mistake. He started talking about all these great discoveries. He's viewed as this downer, reverend person talking about everyone starving. 
But this same essay he started talking about this unshackled spirit of inquiry and, and all these things about diffusion of knowledge and all these things. But somehow didn't think any of that would improve food production. But the reality is food production is an endless golden age. It is just like astrophysics, it is just like any other science where it builds on previous knowledge. And it builds on all these other things that improve human ability to do things. So it turns out over time it's, it's not improving quite as fast as computing, but it is improving geometrically, about 2% per year from the same amount of land. So if we increase the amount of land, we're going to get more than 2%, more than but just from the same amount of land. And there are lots of things that go into that. And certainly today, there's lots of computing that's going into improving yield from farmland. If you look at how people do farming, it's not surprising that it is much more efficient today, both in terms of the number of people needed, but also just in terms of how much you can produce in one acre of land. This applies over time, looks like about a 2% per year improvement. You can also look at the difference today between, so this is China, this is the United States. There's still a big opportunity for improvement in parts of the world even without any new innovations, just spreading what is done in the US and other more developed countries to places where agriculture is less developed. What does Isaac Asimov have to say about this? So this is his prediction for 2014. I think he didn't quite anticipate how much traditional agriculture would improve, but is talking about molecular agriculture. This is really still true today. There are lots of ways to produce things that we can live on, and there's lots of irrational fear about things like genetically modified food, there are big psychological problems there. But certainly there are the technical ones, there's been tremendous progress. And the biggest progress between 64 and today is what's known as the Green Revolution. That was Norman Borlang's work as the, the primary force behind that, where they figured out ways and produced seeds that could produce far more nutrition for the same amount of land and grow much more successfully. And there's a great quote from Penn Jillette of Penn and Teller about how Norman Berlong probably saved billions of lives through this green revolution, and most people have not heard of him. It seems clear that Malthus was not right about this, that this also increases geometrically. What about the other postulate, that population is going to always increase geometrically? Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so we've figured out ways this is also advanced of science that this part of it's probably still true, but it doesn't necessarily need to lead to population increase. The essay from Asimov actually made this point really well. He observed that, yeah, this population seems to keep doubling, and if it keeps doing that, the whole world is going to be like Manhattan in about 500 years. People would not be happy if the whole world was like Manhattan was in 1964. And he sees two easy solutions to this. You can kill people faster, or you can lower the birth rate. Fortunately, the world of 2014 seems to have decided to lower the birth rate rather than increasing the death rate. The prediction he made was the world population in 2014 would be 6.5 billion and the U.S. would be 350 million. So this is remarkably accurate. A little high on the U.S. population and a little bit low on the world population, but remarkably close. And if you look at the trends, if you were in 1964 and saw this trend, you'd be pretty scared, but it's already leveled off. So we never got up to nine, so now we're at seven. Leveled off much more quickly than that. You can see on this graph the, the birth rates going down. Now to the point where it's more of a fear in most countries that there won't be enough young people to support all the old people that are sick and need young people to take care of them. Probably we'll sort that out and there'll be enough medical robots that it won't be a big, big problem. Looks like we're okay on population. So the biggest upcoming catastrophe and the one that probably motivates the engineering school thinking progress is a bad thing is this worry about energy. Energy use seems to be going up exponentially. Energy use leads to carbon dioxide and all these climate change issues and all sorts of bad things happening if we keep using more energy. And maybe we're eventually going to run out of things we need to make energy. Should we be worried about that? Does this curve scare us? So we certainly shouldn't ignore it. If we actually look at this curve, it's not nearly as bad as it looks there. So it looks like, well, from 1960 up to where this curve ends, about 2000, it's gone up by about a factor of four. What else has changed in that time? So this was 1965 income. Right here was the US. That was rich enough to afford a car in the 1960s for the average income. If you were in one of these countries, you were happy if you had enough to eat. So you definitely did not have a car. At this point, all of these countries have got a lot richer. 
and energy consumption has not gone up that much relative to the improvement in quality of life. So in that sense, it's, it's kind of optimistic that the increase is as little as it, it is here. Whether that increase can keep on without changing other things is, I think, a fairly difficult question, but it doesn't seem like one that humanity won't be able to solve. I would take the view that there are, are few resources that are actually finite. We found far more gas than they thought there was when this graph was made by finding ways to extract it. Some of those might be harmful. Some of those might be a lot less harmful than the alternatives. But the real thing that we're getting from this golden age is that knowledge is accumulating. And it's making it easier to acquire more the more we have. And none of these problems seem insolvable. But I will get to my biggest fear, both fear and opportunity, is this, this prediction. So the jobs that people have today, the vast majority of them can be automated. And they will be automated. This means that only a very small fraction of the population, if they're doing similar things to what people are doing today, will be able to actually produce something of value, meaning the human will be able to do something that could not be better done by a machine. So that means either the humans are working for less than it costs for a machine to do it, which is very, very little, or we have to figure out something else to do with all these humans. It should lead to betterment of the human condition if we can automate things. For the most part, it has. When the Luddites happened in the 1800s, it was because there were machines that could automate many of the jobs in spinning wool. They were losing their jobs, so they smashed the machines. And there was a lot of sympathy for that. Certainly, if you look at what's happening today, more and more wealth is going to the small fraction of the, the population. Hopefully, mostly people actually producing things. Unfortunately, a lot of that is people not actually producing things. So this is the big question that I think is going to come out of this, whether all these advances will actually improve human rejoicing. Yes. Uh, so this is a good question. Yeah. So why can't everyone become a creator? And then everyone should be productive, economically useful, and happy. I hope everyone's capable of being a creator. And I think that is the case that given the right opportunity, everyone can probably create interesting things. The big dilemma is how many people can consume them. If everyone's equally a creator, then they're creating for just one other person on average. And that's not enough to be economically sustainable if everyone's a creator and creating from themselves. Now, the reality is, you know, once we have the printing press and we have other ways of replicating things, the best creators are going to create things that can be replicated very cheaply and will be serving millions or billions of people. So it's very hard to see the way that you make everyone a creator in an economically useful way. As computer scientists and software engineers, you hope you're going to be in this part, or at least in, in this part, and, and be those creators. That question is answered a little bit by this. If you look at the number of people that work for these companies, you see a very disturbing trend if you assume that there will always be enough high-paying jobs for software developers. So the revenues of Google and Microsoft are not that different. Microsoft's still a little, little bit higher. Microsoft has more than twice as many people that do that. And if you compare, say, number of employees at Facebook, some of these have increased since the numbers I have here. The 13 at Instagram was at the time that it was bought for a billion dollars. So you only needed 13 employees to get to a company that at least Facebook thought was worth a billion dollars. A lot of the jobs that Microsoft needed 100,000 people for, oh, the Microsoft 100,000 employees, maybe 30,000 are software developers. Significant fraction, but not the majority, I would guess. Many of those now, what one or two people can do, is what took hundreds of thousands of software developers in the 70s or 80s to do. In many ways, that's a great trend. It means one or two people can build really cool things that can have millions of people using them, or even billions of people using them. It raises this question of, well, what are the other 7 billion people in the world supposed to do if you only need a few hundred people to build all these things? Asimov thought about this as well. So he was anticipating this in 1964 and was realizing that the real fear is that because we're going to have all these wonderful gadgets and automate things, that people will suffer from boredom, and there'll be a lucky few who can do creative work that will be the true elite. Most people will be in the society of enforced leisure, which is something that we have certainly not got to in 2014. Now we're more of a society of enforced busy work. But we certainly are technologically capable of becoming more of a society of enforced leisure. As Churchill would say, 
Americans will always do the right thing, so maybe there's hope here, but only after exhausting all other options. Hopefully, we'll figure out some solution to this before it's too late. My charge to you would be to follow the words of Alan Kay. All these predictions are only going to come true if people make them come true, and probably there are better predictions that can come true if you invent better things. So Alan Kay is famous for saying the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So hopefully you will do that.